Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Rainbow Registered Info session with Canada's 2S LGBTQI plus Chamber of Commerce, also known as the TGLCC. Uh, my name is Christopher Shackleton, and I'm the Digital Transformation Projects Coordinator here at the Ontario Museum Association. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a late 20s white male with dark brown hair. And today I'm joining you wearing a blue and white gingham shirt and sitting in front of our blue OMA virtual background. As an organization of provincial scope, the Ontario Museum Association recognizes that its members and community live and work on the lands and territories of Indigenous peoples. We are thankful to the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who have cared for these territories since time immemorial and who continue to contribute to all communities across the province. We acknowledge that there are more than 40 treaties and other land agreements that cover Ontario, and that the descendants and cultures of the First Peoples who lived here are a vibrant and integral part of our society today. We gratefully acknowledge and deeply value the opportunity we have to learn from and cherish the contributions of Indigenous peoples of the past, present, and into the future. As we acknowledge the colonial legacy of museums, we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. As you participate in this gathering, we invite you to reflect on the land that you are on, who the traditional keepers of the land are, what the treaty relationship is, or if it is unceded territory. Toronto, where the OMA offices are located and where I'm joining you from today is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat. This territory is part of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement and is also covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. I wanna make sure that everyone knows how to participate today. You should be able to see the slides and to see and hear our presenters speak. If you'd like to send a question to our presenters, you can simply type your message into the Q&A box that you can access at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to say hello to your colleagues on the call, you can chat with them using the chat feature also available at the bottom of your screen. And while you're at the bottom of your screen, you can turn on automated closed captions by clicking on the CC icon. OMA staff will be monitoring the chat and can help you with any technical questions that you might have. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to uh, throw to our presenters from Canada's 2S LGBTQI plus Chamber of Commerce, also known as the CGLCC, Spencer, Connor, and Merve. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. And thank you so much. And I'll let you take over the slide share there. Apologies, was just changing my name on here so everyone uh, knows who I am. I'll just share my slides quickly. That look good for everyone? Looks great. Perfect. Hello, everyone. I really appreciate you being here with us today um, for our Rainbow Registered Info session. And we're excited to tell you a bit more about the program. And uh, at the same time, we're folding in a little bit of information about the 2S LGBTQI plus travel market um, based on original research that the CGLCC has conducted, uh, which we think will be uh, interesting highlights as you consider the kind of perspective of welcoming guests from other communities that might be traveling in your area. So just before we fully uh, hop in, um, we'll do an intro to our team quickly uh, and the CGLCC, and then we will uh, go over Rainbow Registered in a bit more depth uh, before ending with the uh, 2S LGBTQI plus travel market. And uh, the questions we'll leave till the very end uh, today as we have some of our Rainbow Registered organizations with us today as well to share some of their insights and experience. So that'll be great. So hello, uh, my name is Spencer Toth. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm coming to you today from Kamloops, British Columbia on the traditional enunciate territory of the Tecumloops to Swetmik peoples within the wider Swetmik ancestral territory, Swetmik Kuluk. Uh, I am the program manager for Rainbow Registered, and I also manage uh, the CGLCC's tourism and training programs as well. I uh, am excited to have my colleagues Connor and Merve with me here today, so I will pass over to them to say a quick hello. Hey folks, my name's Connor. I use he, him, and they, them pronouns. Great to see so many faces here in the workshop today. I was looking at uh, everyone who's here as attendees. Great to see you all. I'm the business development manager for our tourism and accreditation programs here at the Canadian 2S LGBTQI plus Chamber of Commerce. And that means I get the privilege of working primarily on Rainbow Registered with our fabulous team here and getting to do great work with businesses and organizations like you folks who are looking to make 
their internal practices uh, and how they engage with the community more to us LGBTQI plus and inclusive with my fabulous colleague, Merve, who you'll get to hear from now. Hello, everyone. My name is Merve. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the business development coordinator for tourism and accreditation programs here at the CGLCC. I'm uh, happy to join you all today and uh, discuss a bit further what it means to be rainbow registered and all the bits and pieces. Um, and that's it. Yeah. Amazing. So a little bit about our organization first. Uh, the CGLCC, or Canada's 2S LGBTQI Plus Chamber of Commerce, uh, is a national nonprofit. This is going to be uh, our 21st year uh, in 2024, and we are essentially a coalition of uh, 2S LGBTQI Plus businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, we bring together allies, in particular Rainbow Registered, that's a big component of the program. Uh, and we work with a wide number of bodies, uh, community partners, government, et cetera, um, to really help make Canada more inclusive. And of course, as a, a Chamber of Commerce, our focus is mostly focused around the business community and the Canadian economy. Uh, but I think the the important work we're doing is, is helping to uh, bring about more inclusion for queer folks across the country. So um, it is a really uh, exciting organization to be a part of. And we have a variety of ways that we support uh, the community and allies to help make that work happen around to us LGBTQI plus inclusion. Uh, so we do have a supplier diversity program for uh, businesses that are majority queer owned and operated uh, to help them get a seat at the table in corporate procurement opportunities. Uh, and we have a variety of mentorship programs, uh, including a new one that we're working on currently uh, that will be rolling out in the coming months. Uh, we have global programming for businesses that are looking to export and we have trade missions, including an mm -hmm. upcoming trade mission to Brazil, which will be exciting next month. As well, then, we, uh, you may have heard that we were selected to administer with the federal government a $25 million 2S LGBTQI plus entrepreneurship program. Uh, so again, that's more focused on queer entrepreneurs and uh, helping to, to demystify that support space for uh, 2S LGBTQI plus owned businesses. Uh, and finally, where Connor Merve and I focus, which is the tourism training and rainbow registered area, uh, tourism and accreditations, as we say. Um, so we do a variety of support in tourism around uh, destination audits and making uh, destinations more 2S LGBTQI plus inclusive. Uh, we have a wide variety of uh, equity, diversity and inclusion training programs related to queer inclusion and then rainbow registered, which we will be sharing more about today. And I will pass it over to Merve to... Uh, take us through uh, some more about Rainbow Registered. Thank you, Spencer. Um, I love to talk about Rainbow Registered. I think it's a, it's a great program and uh, I'm happy to be part of this like amazing team. Um, as a queer woman, as a queer traveler myself, I think this is a, a great initiative to be working on and to be talking about. Um, and today I will dive a bit deeper into what it means to be Rainbow Registered, why we do what we do and why it would be good to become Rainbow Registered, and we're going to go in a bit deeper into the four pillars that we are always looking at. Um, so let me start with uh, what is Rainbow Registered? Um, so we can go over to the next slide already. Um, so Rainbow Registered is a nationally recognized accreditation program for 2S LGBTQI plus inclusive businesses and organizations. Our program was developed by Canada's 2S LGBTQI plus Chamber of Commerce, the CGLCC, Tourism HR Canada, and their partners with the aid of the federal government. This year, in June, during Pride Month, we will reach our three-year anniversary, which is something to celebrate, and we're very proud uh, of having so many accredited business already under our, our, how do you say that, under our arms, under our radar, uh, working with us. And um, our program recognizes Canadian businesses and organizations that are actively working to provide a safe, an inclusive space for their 2S LGBTQI plus customers, staff, and stakeholders. Um, you must ask, okay, why become Rainbow Registered? Uh, why become registered at all? Uh, the Rainbow Registered accreditation and its easily recognizable mark that you see here behind all of us and also on the slides right there 
uh, helps customers, clients, and partners, and prospective employees to identify to as LGBTQI plus friendly businesses and organizations. Uh, the accreditation enables those businesses and organizations to demonstrate their commitment to providing a welcoming and inclusive experience. Your business or organizations will attract and retain customers, clients, and partners, and employees whose values align. So when you are, for example, looking for a place to travel to, looking for a business that you think, okay, uh, I know their values align with mine, I'd rather go there over another business when I plan my trip, when I travel, I choose to plan it accordingly where businesses are already registered and uh, whether it's a hotel, whether it's a brewery, all of them are, are included and can be registered. Um, when should I register? Honestly, uh, now is the time to show your commitment. Um, there's never a wrong time to engage in the application process. Uh, the process will help businesses and organizations uh, to identify areas of improvement and help those who are not yet in a position to become accredited to formulate a strategy and plan to ensure they earn the accreditation in the near future. So we are not looking for people that are already completely inclusive. So we want to help also businesses to get to the next level. This is not a way to um, evaluate and see, okay, they are not there yet. We can't help you out. And just like Spencer mentioned, we have like um, a lot of different programs within the CGLCC that can help, whether it's a training, whether it's like resources to help you bring, uh, bring you to the next level, because it's all about growth and learning. And uh, there's always time to learn. So um, that's why uh, there's, there's no wrong time to register. Um, now, who can qualify? Um, in general, Canadian businesses and organizations of all sizes and from any industry can engage in the accreditation process. Uh, to earn a rainbow registered accreditation, your business or organization will need to meet a set of standards. So the standards I mentioned at the beginning were our four main pillars that the assessor will look into and will assess. So we have our policies and practices, so our first pillar, training, commitment to inclusive leadership, and finally, culture of inclusivity. For policies and practices, we're generally looking into um, if you have like certain policies and practices in place already that either uh, underline a certain practice that you do to how to address your colleague that is going through a transition, for example, how do you engage with folks that um, are being called the, the wrong pronoun? How can I navigate that? The second pillar is training. For training, like I said, there's always time to learn and growth. Some people don't know everything about certain acronyms. Is there maybe uh, an info sheet that uh, volunteers and staff look into before they start their employment or before they start their shift where they know and are aware of how uh, 2S LGBTQI plus inclusion can look like? Then our commitment to inclusive leadership, this is something that we categorize as more of an internal piece. And, and it's another way for businesses and organizations to express their values and priorities. Do you have any philanthropic initiatives? Do you donate? Do you offer your space as an in-kind support to your local queer organization? Um, the culture of inclusivity is uh, something that we categorize as more external. Do you, for example, have any marketing materials that you where you showcase queer couples and uh, do you make like a public use in your space of gender neutral pronouns and maybe carry like some pronoun pins, um, a lot of ums and uh, but those are our four pillars. Um, and how to apply. So um, in order to apply, uh, you visit our Rainbow Registered program page at cglcc.ca and review the application guide. Um, you create a web account, pay the required fee, and submit the application form. Then an assessor will contact you to schedule your assessment. That process is uh, usually very quick. An assessor will be assigned to you, and you can work together with the assessor, uh, and they will answer all your questions, but so will we. Um, the CGSCC will notify applicants of the decision and next steps, and those who meet the standards are accredited and will receive a Rainbow Registered Welcome Kit, containing marketing materials, such as the, 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 the our nice like decal with our logo, uh, inclusion on the new uh, Rainbow Registered Consumer website, hard and digital copies of the Rainbow Registered mark to proudly display, 
And I think what's worth to mention is if you don't meet the standards initially, we won't say goodbye, we will not work with you, sorry, you didn't meet our standards. Because it's about growth and about learning, you have an entire year to gather the necessary information to get to the next level, because we strongly benefit from businesses that are really in to 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 take the next step to uh, that are committed and um so you have an uh, entire year to get reassessed at no additional fee finally um regarding like automatic membership in the cglcc um for those who are accredited uh, a detailed assessment of your organizations to as lgbtqi plus oriented diversity and equity and inclusion efforts will be given um you have an affiliation with the rainbow registered mark you have access to 15 plus online resource guides, marketing to support uh, and special campaigns. Um, and again, monthly What's the Buzz workshops specific to rainbow registered businesses where you can network and learn and connect with other folks. Um, a company listing in our national directory. Uh, and finally, discounts on the CGLCC hosted events, training, workshops, and webinars. I hope I didn't rush through that too quickly. Excuse my uh, nervosity, but um, happy to answer any questions in the chat. And I will, um, I think Spencer will tell you a bit more about the 2S LGBTQ plus travel market. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Marve. And um, yeah, we'll loop back just a little bit after I talk about the travel market, just to kind of summarize Rainbow Registered again. Um, but yeah, and it's nice to see, it looks like the Q and A is, uh, hopping. So that's good to see. So I want to, um, provide a little bit of an additional value add here for all of you, uh, folks that are on the call and talk a little bit more about the, uh, 2SLGBTQI plus travel market, because I think there is a lot of, um, you know, interesting applications. And, you know, when we talk about museums, we're talking a lot about, um, you know, a pretty central component to um, the travel experience for a lot of people, because um, arts and culture is a really popular uh, area of interest for travelers, particularly queer travelers. So I'm happy to share a little bit more about this that you can maybe take away as some uh, thoughts or learnings from this uh, session as well. So when we talk about the 2S LGBTQI plus travel market it is very diverse. So it's not one market. Um, like we we like to sometimes group the, the community together into one, but there's a lot of different interests and needs from each community. Um, so uh, when we talk about the queer travel market, it could be a member of, uh, you know, the, the group itself. You know, if you're lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, two-spirit, uh, queer, um, you know, intersex, it, it could just generally be, you might be grouped in there based on um, your sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Uh, you, but, you know, it could be something where these travelers are traveling as a family unit or as a couple or individually. Um, you know, to us LGBTQI plus travelers can be young, they can be older, uh, they could be foodies, or they could be outdoor enthusiasts. So there's a wide variety of interests. So it's you know, we talk about it as a community um, when we talk about the travel market, but there are a lot of varied interests. So we just like to uh, emphasize that. Um, and in terms of demographics, there are an estimated 30 million individuals in North America that identify as part of the 2S LGBTQI plus community. Um, and this idea that the queer community is usually dinks, dual income, no kids, uh, is uh, rapidly changing as 30% of uh, households with uh, 2S LGBTQI plus folks have one or more children. So um, there is that consideration of the, the queer family, I guess, traveling uh, together that we have to keep in mind. Uh, the 2S LGBTQI plus travel market is highly educated. 45% have at least a bachelor's degree, if not higher. Um, and there is some um, differences across the travel market because a lot of research, um, just to share my background, I, I have a master's in tourism management and I did my master's thesis and some subsequent research publications on rural uh, gay travel in British Columbia. Um, and so something that you see in a lot of research about the, the 2S LGBTQI plus travel market that I've seen, a lot of it focuses on the, the queer community as lucrative and it's true it is a higher spending demographic uh typically 
Um, but, you know, there is a wide variety within there, and we can't just see it as like a homogenous group that all has the same spending ability and travel patterns and everything like that. So um, there are 28% of people within the community that have a household income of over 100,000, but there are um, a, quite a bit that cascade further down from that, including 35% in that next bracket down of 50,000 to 100,000. Um, so we, we just have to keep that in mind that there is a lot of different, um, you know, levels and abilities to travel um, within the community and interests as well. Uh, but overall, the 2S LGBTQI plus travel market is worth uh, $12 billion in Canada annually, and it has been growing significantly over the past decade. Uh, the overall North American travel market to include the U.S. and Mexico in, uh, is estimated at $70 billion annually, and then the global market is estimated at $200 billion annually. Um, so it is not just a niche anymore. It is a, a, a travel demographic that has, uh, you know, spending power in, in the market. But there's a lot more than simply asking for the business of the community. And that's one of the things that Rainbow Registered aims to do is we want all of the businesses that work with us through the program to be very authentic in their intentions to welcome queer folks to their uh, organization and to their business. So um, when we look at the overall travel habits of the 2 LGBTQI plus community, um, on average, uh, Canadian queer travelers spend $1,855 per trip compared to $265 per trip for the general traveling public. Uh, so there is a wide disparity there. Um, the queer community tends to spend more when they travel, they travel further afield, um, and they travel more often. Um, so 50% of those high income households that we mentioned spend over $2,000 per person per leisure trip um, and travel three to four times per year. And then there is some disparities we found in research about differences within the community. As an example, we found that lesbian travelers have a higher tendency to take more frequent trips, but they're shorter in length, whereas gay travelers might take less trips per year, but they are uh, more medium length trips uh, or something a little bit longer. But ultimately, I have mentioned, you know, the, the queer community tends to have higher, you know, spend when they travel. But um, just to further emphasize, compared to their, their straight or heterosexual peers, uh, the 2S LGBTQI plus travel market um, and travelers tend to have much higher rates of passport ownership. Uh, they have higher disposable incomes and they have a demonstrated resilience and faster recovery time after an industry shock. Um, as we have seen uh, after 9-11, after we've seen after SARS and early research is showing that that is the same with COVID-19 and, and the recent pandemic. So uh, it is an important demographic when we're looking at the recovery of tourism as well. Um, so earning the trust of the community, it comes down to authenticity and meaningful engagement. We want to see a commitment to making your, your products or services inclusive and that you're really making an effort to welcome the community to your business. Uh, and, you know, lots of research has shown that the uh, 2S LGBTQI plus travel market um, is very loyal. So building that trust and being authentic and how you go about that is something that will earn you uh, the, the trust of the community for years to come. Just to quickly go over a few more things so I can leave some time at the uh, end of our portion of this info session uh, for Connor to, to wrap things up. Um, some of the top destination motivators on the screen here, I won't go through all of them, but I do want to emphasize that when they're traveling, uh, 2S LGBTQI plus folks, when they're choosing which destination to visit, their top consideration is safety. Um, and this is something that is unique from uh, compared to the general traveling public. So we really have to be uh, working with our local DMOs and local government and other uh, organizations to really say, hey, we want to uh, support greater inclusion in the community and really helping to uh, champion uh, 2S LGBTQIA plus travel is important. Um, and that extends even to some other considerations around that kind of tie into safety. So people might consider the political climate 
they might consider the reputation of a community for welcoming the 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 two S L G B T Q I plus community. It's all important. Um, and there's even you know the consideration. It's down there at the end in ninth, but um, two S L G B T Q I plus culture and history is something that is of interest to a lot of folks. So. Um, that is a consideration as well when you're looking at, you know, museums and art galleries and various cultural uh, opportunities for them to engage with is how can we provide a lens or perspective uh, from uh, the queer community and how that might be attractive to people that are looking to visit uh, our space. When it comes to tourism activities, though, as I mentioned, arts and culture is very popular. Um, in our research, it was the fourth most popular activity when traveling. Uh, so I just really wanted to emphasize that. But just to quickly go through, um, the top interests were food and dining, popular tourist activities, which, you know, that also kind of touches on arts and culture quite a bit, too. Um, so, you know, museums and that play a big role in, in popular tourist activities in a destination. Uh, outdoor activities were of interest, arts and culture, visiting family and friends, which is pretty common, and then all the way over to shopping and wellness and festivals and the like. Um, and 2SLGBTQI plus events are something that, you know, while they might not be the top of the list, it is something that is a unique interest of the community as well. So just to wrap up then, I just want to emphasize that we've developed this system, and I'm happy to chat about this if anyone has questions in the future, about... Um, the six essential elements uh, for successful 2SLGBTQI plus tourism development um, that we developed as part of the work we're doing on our destination audit program for destination marketing organizations that are looking to improve their 2SLGBTQI plus market readiness of their community. Um, so the things we find that are most successful with attracting queer travelers to a destination are having an engaged and visible local community. Uh, establishing clear values, vision, and plan for welcoming the community to the area, uh, building collaborative local, regional, and broader partnerships. Uh, we see a lot of destination marketing organizations working together with industry to develop like a task force, for example, uh, to focus on welcoming the queer community to uh, the area. Um, it, it requires a dedicated investment and support, so you need to be intentional and really work on welcoming the community explicitly. Um, it's uh, usually something around offering unique products and experiences is something that is always helpful in attracting this audience, as well as implementing inclusive marketing strategies and promotional activities. So looking at the diversity and the imagery even is something that you can do uh, pretty much immediately. I mean, of course, with budgets and photography and all of that, there's other considerations, but uh, the 2SLGBTQI plus community finds value in seeing themselves reflected in the imagery and the, the copy and that used for marketing. So just to wrap up, just to give some ideas, um, you know, this, uh, what we talked about there about offering unique products and experiences. Um, some of those types of products and experiences that, you know, we've seen have had a lot of impact in the tourism uh, market here in Canada are things like festivals and events. You know, Pride Festivals, of course, is the one that everyone knows about. There's lots of ski and snowboard weeks that happen throughout the country that are targeted at the 2SLGBTQI plus community. Um, culinary festivals, film festivals, um, specific 2SLGBTQI plus focused experiences with local storytellers that are part of the community, uh, or even we see, um, as I, I'm sure Michael might talk to a bit um, with one of their exhibits that highlighted um, the, the 2SLGBTQI plus community at the Mississippi Valley Textile Museum. Um, there is a authentic um, component to sharing the works even of queer artists. Um, there's group tours you could consider, um, you know, outdoor activities, maybe not relevant to museums here necessarily, but, uh, any sort of group activities in general, uh, could be of interest. Uh, maybe it's specific tours to talk through, uh, some stuff in the local community about the queer community, or even considering integrating into existing programming or festivals. So I want to pass it over to Connor to kind of uh, take you back to the, the Rainbow Registered side of things. And thanks for your time uh, as I talked a bit about the travel market.
Fabulous. Thanks, Spencer and Merve. I'm so impressed with our team. We love talking about this program and I, I especially can sometimes go on and on, but we kept it to our 30 minute mark. So I'll keep it nice and short and sweet here, especially because I know that we have two of our rainbow registered organizations slated to speak next and no better way to learn about the program and folks experiences than to hear from people who have actually gone through it themselves and our rainbow registered organizations. So just a little bit kind of to summarize here, you folks have heard about how we accredit businesses. You folks have heard about the 2S LGBTQI plus travel market. So I'm sure you folks are getting the picture that being rainbow registered is more than just slapping up a rainbow flag on your window and saying that you're accredited. Uh, it's an assessment that partners you with our accreditation team to really do a spot check as to what you're doing in your business, your policies and practices, your training, how you're engaging with the community and how you're engaging internally with your own workforce to create a culture of inclusion within your workplace. Uh, it, it's a special thing to be rainbow registered and we're so lucky to have worked with over 450 businesses uh, up at this point who have engaged with us on the accreditation process. Now, we talked about the accreditation, but there's a lot more to rainbow registered than just the accreditation piece. Uh, it's really special that rainbow registered is administered by the Canadian 2S LGBTQI plus Chamber of Commerce because it allows us to be more than just an accrediting body. While Merve and I focus on telling people about the accreditation, Spencer and his team focus on uh, doing the accreditation with folks and the programming element after. So we've got monthly get togethers for our rainbow registered businesses, our micro lunch and learns where we do little DEI sessions focused on the rainbow registered pillars and uh, some continuous learning that we offer. But we've also got so many resources that we extend to folks who um, are going through the process. And uh, Merve mentioned, you know, sometimes folks will come to us and they'll be so ready and we're able to put them through right away. But a lot of the time businesses have some work that they want to do as well. And we are able to support folks through it by providing access to some resources that we have like a 2S LGBTQI plus inclusive policy guide, an inclusive workplace guide. We've got multiple 2S LGBTQI plus uh, travel market ready guides and, and some workbooks that go along with them too that are really useful. Um, and just so much that comes, you know, that's just the rainbow registered piece. There's also the general chamber membership. So there's on the business side, if there's things you're interested in learning as well, you can tap into those chamber resources. So uh, lots that you can get out of being a rainbow registered member. We've got our consumer facing website, which you're seeing the front page of right here, where we list all of our rainbow registered businesses across the country. And when folks are planning a trip, they can zoom in, decide where they want to go, where they want to stay, who they want to visit, what they want to do while they're on their trip, knowing that where they go is going to be providing that inclusive experience that they're looking for. The accreditation itself, it lasts for three years, okay? So you get accredited on that very first year. Uh, and then on the third year, we do a check-in. We uh, It's not as, uh, I would say, stringent as the initial accreditation. Uh, we do a check-in with you just to, you know, see has anything changed? What have you been doing since? You know, sometimes people leave workplaces, sometimes values change. We want to make sure that all of our rainbow registered businesses are up to that rainbow registered standard. Uh, and yeah, if, you know, like I said, a lot of businesses come to us from uh, all kinds of different places. Uh, some folks have done so, so much work. We've even had businesses that have met almost every single best practice that we, we look for in the accreditation. Those are our superstars. Um, to get officially accredited, you need to have three pieces of evidence under each of the four pillars that we look for. So of course, those those take all kinds of different shapes depending on the unique organization uh, that we're working with. And we've got a lot of resources that we can share with folks depending on maybe there's some gaps that we identify throughout the accreditation. Well, if policy, well, we can uh, connect you with some policy. If it's training, we can connect you with some good training. Uh, we There's a lot of supports that we can do um, for businesses who want to undergo the accreditation. So if you're listening to us and you're thinking, hmm, I don't think we're quite there yet, it's definitely worth chatting with us because we might be able to connect you with some great resources. And even the assessment itself is fabulous because you get um, a report after the accreditation that will highlight what the as assessor identified as what you're doing. But it, it, they'll also give you kind of a section where of, of their notes where they suggest, okay, this is where I think they should work into for 2S LGBTQI plus inclusion. It can help you with some direction too. And because we've worked with so many businesses, up until this point, we've got some great success stories and best practices that have worked really well in other spaces. We've got actually a bunch of museums involved. I know we have St. Marie among the Hurons. We've got Discover Harbor, the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21, uh, the Atlantic Canada Aviation Museum, uh, Africville here in Halifax, 
multiple art galleries, Canada's uh, Cold War Museum, which is interesting, and a bunch more museums through it, um, science centers involved. Uh, truly, it's, a, I think, a great time for museums to be getting on board with this. Just uh, we've had actually a lot of success with museums up until this point with the accreditation. So really excited to chat with folks who are interested about Rainbow Registered. And I, like I said, I could talk all day about this, but uh, I'll tone myself down and now and I'll pass it over to our fabulous Rainbow Registered businesses who are here to share their experience with you folks. And here are our emails up on the screen here. Spencer is our program manager. I'm the business development manager for Rainbow Registered and Merve is our fabulous coordinator on the business development side as well. So you can reach out to any of us and we'll be happy to chat about all the questions in the world about Rainbow Registered, but who knows, they might get answered. So I'll pass it over. Well, thank you so much, Spencer, Merve, and Connor. Uh, no worries, everybody. We'll be passing along these slides to all of you who registered today and they'll be attached to this recording for forever. Um, so you don't have to worry about writing those emails down uh, hurriedly right now. We'll get them to you by email as soon as we can process our recording. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to a couple of museums who've actually gone through the process of becoming Rainbow Registered. We're going to start with Michael Regley Lancaster, who's executive director and curator of the uh, Mississippi Valley Textile Museum. So he was born and raised in Chatham, Ontario, and he's been executive director curator of the MVTM since July 1st of 2007. He studied fine arts at Fanshawe College in London, Ontario, before receiving a diploma in applied museum studies from Algonquin College in Ottawa. He started as a summer volunteer at MVTM, then becoming assistant curator at Diefenbunker, Canada's Cold War Museum, followed by program coordinator for Young Canada Works in Heritage Organizations at the Canadian Museums Association. Paving the way for safe museum spaces, Michael has empowered the MVTM to become Canada's first rainbow registered museum and pioneer the proclamation of Pride Month within Mississippi Mills. Michael also strives for inclusivity and diversity of the sector within his involvement in local municipal committees and the Ontario Museum Association's own executive council. Michael is a proud member of the 2S LGBTQIA plus community. Michael, uh, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. My, my pronouns are he, him. I'm a white cis male and a proud member of, of the 2S LGBTQIA plus community. I would like to start, I'm just going to take you on a little bit of a journey of what we've been through and probably many um, over time have heard this journey, but what started this process for our museum was we, in 2019, we put up our first rainbow uh, flag on our museum's building. We left it up for several months um, and very little never really heard any negativity. It was very positive. Um, and certainly I can hear like when people enter our museum, I can hear the positivity. I can hear what they're saying. And I could hear them talking to each other saying, oh, I feel welcome here. And and it was just little things like that that made like maybe just go, okay, this is this is worth it. This is good because sometimes it can be scary for us. And, and so it was that little bit of just putting up a flag and, and hearing the positive difference as visitors came through. Then come 2020, uh, the community started to grow in that positivity and, and formed a pride committee um, for the first time. Then it, we put up a new flag in, in January because the other one was getting pretty worn out and uh, ratty from the weather. So we put up a, a new flag in for June for Pride Month. It was the first time um, we really did any pride initiatives um, and education and programming in partnership with the new Pride Committee. Then halfway through the month, the flag was not there. The pole was gone as well. We ended up finding it in a neighboring park, shred. Right away, this was scary for my staff and I. We were in, uh, as everyone was, lockdowns. So it was it was a very scary and we were relieved to be able to have our doors locked. Um, but within within no time, the police were here. They did take it seriously as a hate crime. And they did they tried to find the perpetrators. Um, and they did have some video surveillance and did catch them on camera, but it wasn't clear enough to confirm whom they were. However, from that, a local community couple came together and did a GoFundMe to replace the flag. And they ended up, it was actually in some ways comical because all the stores in the region throughout Ottawa, the Valley, et cetera, were sold out of rainbow flags in no time 
once they raised the money because they 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 raised enough to just I can't even remember how much the dollar amount was, but they raised enough to buy out all the stores. Then it became a, an initiative where the community rallied and we were getting calls, can can I have a flag? Can I have a flag? So we were giving out flags, whether it was stickers on uh, for doors and stores to um, flags to put on windows. And our downtown and our community was just inundated with positive rainbow flags throughout our community. And it didn't take us long to feel safe again. Hence the value of the rainbow and progress pride flags and so in this journey, our mayor stood up right away, called out, we do not have hate in our community. And we have seen positive change within our, our, our municipal council as well. They annually reach out to us for 2SLGI plus training. And they've done that for their management staff as well as some challenges came up that I called out and now they, they're doing that annual training also. It, is, it has been such an exciting journey. And then during that time, then applying for the Rainbow Registered, because I thought we need to do more. And then I started even more putting myself out there and putting our team out there. And it opened our doors in so many ways. I can't explain the positivity probably near enough. The positiveness of more people getting involved with our organization. It has grown volunteerism in in a, a more positive 2SLGBI plus engagement, including changing our staff dynamic that we have more queer people on our staff, as well as just changing that narrative and opening up discussion. We have started to open doors to talk more about 2SLGBI plus history. So we have an exhibit panel in our building that actually showcases some of the main poignant parts of Canadian history. We're going to do more and more over the years, but just as a start point, just to get a little um, information put into our system, because I do think all museums should be having 2SLGI plus history as a part of, of their narrative and 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 to, to grow on true histories as we're growing so much and learning about 2SLGI plus histories, but we're also learning about true um, Indigenous and BIPOC histories. And I think we all should be showcasing those histories and showcasing them proudly and working with the appropriate communities to do so. It's It's been such a, an interesting journey and, and a couple of other things. We've opened our doors more now also to um, for our exhibition proposals because at our museum, we showcase art and history exhibitions all around textiles. So it's open the door. We have it as a priority within our uh, exhibit proposals for 2SLM2I artists, I plus artists to apply, BIPOC artists to apply, Indigenous, and making that very accessible for people to apply and encourage them. So we've seen a lot more um, engagement that way of proposals coming in, but then also being able to showcase that work. So as, as Spencer mentioned, and I think it's a great example, and thank you for reminding me of that, in um, the last last quarter of, of 2023, we hosted um, a queer artist uh, from Ottawa, Carl Stewart. And he's done many activism uh, exhibitions over the years that have been very well received um, and challenged people's thinking. And I happened upon the exhibition in Ottawa at a gallery, and I knew I had to bring it here. What he had done was these mini uh, handwoven tapestries that um, he used flags uh, as inspiration from other countries, from 60 other countries around the world where it's still illegal to be queer. In that, it showcased these beautiful pieces, but with this true story and putting out there exactly which countries it's illegal. and. In his talk with community members that came to one of his um, lectures, he showed imagery and truths that were hard to see and hard to know, but it opened a door for real conversation. And that to me is so important for museums to do that. It talked very clearly, and this is, might be hard to hear, but it talked very clearly about how 
those a lot of those countries, the 60 countries where it's illegal to be gay, are places that promote killing of queer people. And it and it talked and showcased about um, people being pushed off buildings, people waiting down below, community members wait to stone them if they don't die immediately. Hard truths that really open a door of conversation that there's so much more to do in the world. We belong and people need to know that we belong. It has opened our door. We have transgender people involved now with our organization. We have parents who come and visit the museum ahead of any of their, their family. And then after they tour, they go to the volunteers say, I can bring my children here. It's a safe space. That just means everything. To know that your, your doors are open for all community and a safe place for all community. And you can't say community without opening doors for everyone. Um, so yeah, it's a very exciting journey. It's been very empowering. And I must say, working with the chamber, we gain insights monthly on, on webinars and calls, and they're also there to support and listen and empower each other on a journey. It's so exciting and empowering to work with that group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. We're gonna hear another perspective from Deborah Seabrook, who is the manager of Heritage Resource Management at the City of Hamilton's Tourism and Culture Division. So Deborah Seabrook is manager there at the City of Hamilton's Tourism and Culture Division. Uh, since graduating from Fleming College with an honors diploma in collections and conservation management, she has worked as a curator, senior curator, executive director, and project program manager. Throughout her 16 year career at the City of Hamilton, she has consistently put into practice her abiding commitment to equity, social justice, and to its LGBTQIA allyship. She's a champion of progressive change in the sector and has worked tirelessly to lead the Hamilton Civic Museums and their staff toward a deeper and more collaborative and co creative relationship with their audiences and communities. She was a founding member of the city's EDI steering committee and led the Hamilton Civic Museums to achieve rainbow registered certification in 2023. I take it away, Deborah. Oh, thank you. I don't even know how to follow that, um, especially follow Michael's journey. Uh, that was um, very impressive and empowering just to hear how the community got behind him. Uh, I'm Deborah Seabrook. Uh, my pronouns is she, her. I am a cis uh, female and I consider myself an ally. Um, just going to take a quick step back to say that uh, my, the push behind uh, getting this was to watch, uh, was personal, uh, watching a family member as they struggled uh, in their journey to see themselves reflected in our community and in the services being offered and supported through our community. And it made me take a step back and kind of look at what we were doing at the museums um, and how we were operating and the services we were providing at the museums. And if I couldn't impact those for my family member, then I felt like I was failing as an ally. So that kind of was the impetus behind moving forward. Um, I didn't do all the work alone behind a rainbow uh, certification. Um, I had a colleague, Mara Benjamin, who helped um, me a lot with getting the documentation and looking into uh, the registration of the program. And uh, I do thank her a lot for her work that uh, which she did involved. I have it from a different perspective from Michael because we are a municipality. So um, our certification is for tourism and culture, which is my division. And uh, what we looked at, um, we benefited a lot because the city was already moving towards more inclusive uh, language in its policies and its procedures and in its training. And through my um, involvement with the steering committee, we were already moving towards developing a better culture within the city and training tools on how to support and be uh, as leaders and as colleagues to support LGB, uh, 2S LGBTQIA plus uh, members within the workforce and within our community. So a lot of that foundational work was already in process. So I was looking at it more from the museum's perspective and kind of the culture as I perceived um, within our museum environments for our staff as well as for our visitors. Um, so some of the basic fundamental things that visitors would see as, as far as 
um, a pride flag um, proudly displayed on our, our desks and on our front foyers. But what did that mean to staff? What did that mean to our visitors? Making sure the staff were aware um, why we were doing this and what it meant to them and to the visitors. Simple things uh, that aren't so simple, like bathrooms, making sure we had um, gender neutral bathrooms um, at most of our sites, which you can imagine sometimes are a bit of a challenge in museums when you're limited by historic houses or spaces, um, but figuring out how to manage that and how to navigate that. Um, we looked at um, one of the things I'm particularly proud about is we have a couple sites that do uh, costumed interpretation. Um, so we're looking at our staff to say, uh, you have the right to choose a costume of, because uh, oftentimes the costumes were gender specific. You can choose the gender uh, costume of your choice that you feel comfortable in wearing, or if you're not comfortable in either one of those gendered costumes, then we'll provide you with a, uh, a just a neutral polo with the city logo and you can wear those so you're not obligated to wear a gendered costume in the performance of your job and then providing them and their colleagues with language around how to support that if a visitor asks you know why aren't they in costume what we could say um, that is respectful to the colleague as well as to um, uh, to the initiative and, and to the visitor so working through some of those uh, things to provide a, a more uh, equitable environment for our staff and to so visitors can approach us and feel comfortable as well uh, working on our, making sure that we include our pronouns and what we do and when we introduce ourselves. Um, as far as programming, uh, we've seen some advance. We have so much more to do. Um, I have a colleague, Meredith Leonard, who worked very hard on um, our new website, which I encourage you to look at, it's hamiltoncivicmuseums.ca. And uh, one of the initiatives that was on as digital exhibits there is Points of Pride. So Meredith worked with um, some community members to pinpoint historic and heritage points within the Hamilton community that had uh, well, points of pride. It had a relationship to the 2SLGBTQIA plus community um, historically and tell those stories and those narratives. Um, we've had cooking workshops hosted at one of our sites for trans youth so they can come in and, and enjoy um, a great environment where they learn traditional uh, hearth fire side cooking with some very traditional recipes but it's also a community that they can feel comfortable in and that was connecting with some of our partners uh, within the community for uh, youth and trans youth so these are just some of the things that we've worked on uh, like I said we have so much more we could do and we are working on the city is continues to enhance their learning and development and their policies and procedures um, I am just part of a of that cog, but we take our commitment to um, to the under, what we consider underserved communities very very seriously. So those members of the two S L G B T Q I A plus uh, BIPOC, um, making sure that they're that we are amplifying their voices and working with them within our community um, to present either digital uh, stories, narratives, however, um, th the stories that want to be told or the initiatives are that we are representing them in a, in a way that is beneficial and meaningful to them. And one thing I forgot to say is that I am in Hamilton and I'm coming to you from the traditional lands of the Ashinaabe and, and Haudenosaunee. And I think that is about it, because um, I want to be respectful of time. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing, Deborah, and thank you so much to Deborah and Michael for sharing both how it matters both to them personally and matters to their organizations that um, that their organizations are rainbow registered. Um, so we're going to we have a, some time left for questions today. So you're welcome to put any questions you have into the Q and A box. We have a few ready to go, so I'll get started. I'm going to ask our museum panelists first, um, what advice would you give to other organizations that are undertaking this process? Maybe we'll start with Michael. Just do it. I, I don't know uh, what, what <laughs> I'm not sure it's a pretty gen general question, but I, I really honestly, it's such a supportive group at the, at the Chamber of Commerce. I think it's just an easy, 
it generally is a great process. And even if you're not like, like was said, even if you're not right away approved, it gives you a journey and they support you in getting to that point. So I just think it's something you just, you just need to do it. Uh, same question to you, Deborah. Any, oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with what he said. Um, it It's not an imposing process. Um, the chamber makes it so easy um, to understand and to connect with. And um, I was intimidated coming from municipality. I thought there's no way we're gonna have enough in place um, that would qualify us. Um, but they were willing to work with us. And so I surprised myself even in knowing that there were things that the city was moving on that we were doing that um, qualified us. And I was kind of, it made me a little proud of uh, our municipality, I have to admit that, and I'm not saying we don't have a long ways to go, but I was pretty proud that they already were putting things in place, moving in a very positive direction. Um, and so, yes, they're very good to work with and uh, it's actually not as intimidating as you might think. Excellent, a question for our Rainbow Registered colleagues. Is there anything that we should have in place before we get started applying or areas where you see people have the most uh, need of improvement when they first start their application process? Usually biggest need that we see is training. Uh, honestly, a lot of the times that's the hardest to access for a lot of people because it does cost you know money usually to engage in training or things like that um fortunately we do have options and we do have um some programming we're doing in atlantic canada right now um that we welcome people from other parts of the country to engage with as well um for example we're doing our three hour uh, navigating to us lgbtqi plus diversity and inclusion in the tourism industry training uh next week on the 20th um, and it's completely free of charge to attend. So we encourage you to sign up. It looks like um, the chat, um, it looks like Chris might have put something in the chat there with the link. So that's great. Thank you. Um, so if you want to attend, definitely feel free to join us for that. And we'll have more trainings coming over the next two years through our partnership with the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. And again, we we do like to present the opportunity to, to people from other communities as well, just because that is something that's an easy way to start getting the through the door when it comes to the training component. Um, I forgot if there was another part of that question. Apologies. Um, but I know there's a lot of questions. So um, yeah, I mean, engage with us at any time, as Merve mentioned during the presentation. Um, even if you're not fully ready at the start, you do get that year to implement some of the feedback and and ask to be reassessed and there's no additional cost to get reassessed. Um, so that's great. And I, I saw Merve answered in the Q&A written, um, but nonprofits do get a 15% discount. Um, so if you do use, uh, you can contact us for the code or it's just, I believe, nonprofit 15 when you're uh, checking out or at the billing stage of the application process. Um, and that will be, yeah, something that you can take advantage of. Excellent, thank you. A question specifically for Debra. Um, were there any additional considerations for assessing practices or implementing any necessary changes across the multiple sites at Hamilton Civic Museums and Compass? Um, not particularly. So we are, uh, Hamilton Civic Museums has seven, well, seven museum sites, eight if you include the one that's underwater. And, uh, <laughs> And so most of those are historic homes um, to some degree. So they operate and practice in a very similar manner. Um, so it was fairly easy to standardize that. We also uh, recently, um, uh, just recently retired director, sorry, manager, whom I replaced, John Summers, developed an excellent uh, Hamilton Civic Museum strategy that provided some priorities for our future. And uh, so it was also inclusive of the 2SLGBTQI plus community and our interpretive uh, strategies as well that uh, my colleague who I mentioned earlier, Meredith Leonard uh, drafted. Um, so we've had some procedures, some policies, some strategies put in place um, that helped kind of standardize our approach. Um, but yes, you've got a bunch of little mini kingdoms or fiefdoms, and you are trying to get everybody to work together um, and to all different, slightly different focuses. But every single staff member is committed to be more inclusive, which is so encouraging, um, so encouraging across the board. 
I think this is going to be our last question, and I'll let each of you take a turn at it. We'll start with Michael. Um, are there any strategies you have for engaging and um, working with your volunteer base, particularly perhaps an older demographic and for a smaller museum, for example? Yeah, we have regular um, open sessions, dialogue and training with our with our front of house, especially volunteers, but also our board of directors. Um, so it's it's really opening that dialogue, but also having that professional training and engaging. We've actually engaged the Chamber of Commerce because uh, they have training components. So we've engaged them in some training um, and coming on site because you you have facilitators all around Canada. So it's 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 a really great resource and and certainly it's keeping that momentum of open discussion and dialogue. Um, yeah, so we don't have a lot of volunteer organizations as, that are directly connected to our museums. Uh, we work with a lot of community groups, um, but um, we have put our focus more in um, training our employees, um, because it, when you do, Michael, you had the experience, the horrible experience of the flag, when you put proudly display your support, sometimes there's negativity that could come from proudly uh, displaying that. So working with our volunteer, sorry, our employees, um, doing some scenario training to give them the tools in which they know how to respond and when they can pass it off to a supervisor, because there has unfortunately been opportunities, not opportunities, there's been situations um, of negative um, that have experienced. So we're kind of glad that we put some work behind there um, with staff just to better prepare them uh, in case it's, I'm, sad in that I have to do that, but it also is empowering to the staff to know that they have the right and they to not tolerate the behavior or the speech and how to respond in that situation. And just one last thing, I know we're all done, but I want to pop this in here for organizations involved in tourism in Northern Ontario. Uh, we've actually got funding through FedNor to cover 100% of the initial fees to get you involved for your first year. So any folks here that are in Northern Ontario, uh, there will be no fees uh, or costs for your first year if you want to get involved and get accredited. Yeah, so again, touch with our team uh, if, you, if that pertains to you. So... Um... Just also want to highlight that in the Q and A, if if you have time before the the session ends here, just pop in and look at some. We've been answering some questions throughout the the session about things like fees and funding and things like that. So, um, yeah, it, it's been great to be here with all of you. Well, thank Thanks, you everybody. so much, everybody, for your time today, uh, both for our presenters and those who joined us as attendees. Um, the recording will be sent by email with the presenter slides, um, with links and the re all the resources we've shared today and that we can find to help support you in your processes and getting ready to be Rainbow Registered. Um, as a final note, when you leave the webinar, you'll be directed to a survey, which is grateful for us to help learn more about um, your experience today and how we can support you in your professional development. Uh, so thank you so much, everybody, and have a great rest of your day and look for that recording by email. Uh, thanks so much again to Spencer, Merve, Connor, Michael, and Deborah, and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, folks. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.